Hey folks, welcome back. We are going to change uh, gears on the channel for a little bit. We're going to talk about timber framing. Specifically, we are going to get back to the layout portion of the build thread for my timber framed woodworking shop. I know it's been a long time since the last video. A lot of folks have been asking me for part two. I apologize for that. The last few years has been quite a ride for us as well as anybody, as many other people. But we have uh, purchased our property and we put up the first building on the property to give me a place to work. Yes, you are looking at a timber frame, but this is not the timber frame that is the subject of the build thread. This is a uh, different building, a very simple and utilitarian structure. The build thread for the woodworking shop is actually going to continue uh, basically this fall and uh, with the objective of putting the building up by next year. I'll give you a few more details on that at the end of the video. But what I want to do is jump right back into the layout discussion. What we'll do is we will uh, revisit quickly the concepts that we talked about in the last video. We'll answer a few common questions that I've gotten and we'll move right on to a few tips and tricks. Now how we're going to do this, these timbers in front of me are uh, posts for a commercial job that I'm working on right now. So what we're going to do is apply these principles and ideas to one of these posts Primarily because the last timber that we talked about this on was a fairly simple tie beam and a few people had questions about how it would work with different members intersecting um, a timber on different planes. And that's exactly the situation we have in this post. We have things going on on three out of four surfaces at all different elevations. So we're going to revisit the uh, idea or reiterate the ideas and we're going to add a little bit of complexity and answer, answer some of those questions. So let's start off with recapping the line rule discussion from the last video. Okay, so we have our timber before us and we know it is not perfectly straight, it's not perfectly square, perhaps it has a little bit of twist to it, or all of the above. But we know we cannot reliably lay the framing square against the edge of the timber, denote all of our joinery along the length of the timber, and expect everything to go together well. We also are operating under the assumption for this video that you don't have the means to fix it, uh, straighten it out, and you don't have the means to throw it out and get another one that is perfectly straight. Now line rule techniques give us two lines that are perfectly straight, perfectly flat and perfectly 90 degrees from each other that we can use to denote and lay out our joinery. Our primary tool for this was the humble spirit level. With this level we can draw two lines on the end of the timber, one perfectly level and one perfectly plumb. And when we connect those lines along the faces of the timber, what we have are uh, two perfectly flat planes that are 90 degrees to each other that we can use to lay out our joinery. Now it's best to think of these lines as basically where those planes emerge from the timber because the timber may have still have its surface flaws, its undulations. And for example, the line that's on this face of the timber it may go up and down a little bit, so it won't be perfect in this way, but it'll be perfect in this way. Same with along the side. The lines may go up and down with the undulations of the timber, but they will be perfect this way. So wherever one is imperfect, the other is perfect. You put the two of them together, and we have a system for reliably and accurately laying out joints. Now, the system that uh, we are using to deal with the irregularities at the joint locations our housings. It's following the logic that the timbers don't have to be perfect everywhere, they just have to be reliably perfect at the joint location. So we modify the timber at the joint locations with housings to make everything perfect. Okay, so I've gotten a lot of questions about where we snap the chalk lines and why. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it doesn't really matter theoretically anyway where you snap the line so long as it's done with care and you use the lines carefully when laying out your joinery. However, there are two kind of general categories. One where you snap the lines in the dead center of your timbers, which is very common in Eastern approaches to timber framing, versus where it's along or adjacent to one edge, which is more common with Western timber framing. Now, I use both approaches, and I'll talk a little bit more about the two of them and where I might use one versus the other. Okay, so if you have learned and studied Western approaches to timber framing, you're building Western style frames and you're using a framing square for your layout, it may make most sense for you to have your chalk lines adjacent to or along one edge. You can still use these to define straight, 
flat and square planes on your irregular timbers to facilitate layout. But you can also use this to serve double duties to, um, to define one cheek of your tenon, for example, or even one edge of your, of your mortise. But conveniently, you can also lay it, your framing square all carefully along the chalk line and your framing square will often reach all the way across the timber. This is great for doing squaring lines, but also denoting the uh, various points of joinery along the face of your timber. You can do this with just laying the framing square on the timber once, which is faster, but it also reduces the likelihood of error. And though I normally do center lines right nowadays, um, for timbers where the majority of the joinery is only happening along one face, I will often denote a chalk line along the adjacent edge, which denotes the housing depths for all the joinery that's happening on that one face. This means I don't have to measure to find out where the housing is. I have a line that shows it for me. Now where it goes depends on what issues the timber may have. Cue example. Okay, so it's easy to throw in uh, too many examples and end up making a video seven hours long, but I couldn't resist uh, taking advantage of an opportunity that sprang up to give you a scenario where you may want to put your chalk lines indeed against one edge, but as measured from the opposite edge. These three timbers right here are top plates for a commercial job that I'm working on right now. Top plates are usually, and especially in this case, is very, very simple. There's no joinery that happens at the top and no joinery that happens on either side in this situation anyway. There are just some post tops into the bottom of these as well as their corresponding braces. Now, these timbers are, are lovely timbers. They're very well machined. They're very well made. Um, but some of them are oversized and one of them has a bit of a taper. So it's about, it's not quite 10 and a quarter inches deep on, these are eight by tens, and about 10 and a quarter inches deep on uh, one end almost, and it's more than one and five eighths on the other end. So had I simply done a nominal half inch housing, because we're doing half inch housings for most of this job, has it, had I done a half inch housing for this on the bottom, the joinery would have been would have been great. Everything would have gone together nicely, no problem at all. But the problem is, is the extras in the uh, the depth would have been on the top, and you would have a top plate that is sloping, and you would have had top plates that are slightly uneven because it's taking three of them to go on the length of the building, and they're not oversized by the same amount. So what we're doing is we're measuring down instead of half an inch up from the bottom of these timbers for a nominal nine and a half inch timber, what we're doing is we're measuring down from the top nine and a half inches and putting any of the irregularities that may be in that timber on the bottom. What you end up with is a top plate where the elevations are all identical. They meet neat and tidy at the tops and over the posts and the elevation is always the same because this is a hybrid job which means that there are commercial trusses being manufactured and they are being manufactured according to a specification that assumes a particular rise and run. And it's my job to put the elevation of the top plates in the same space, in the same place, all the way along the length of the building so the geometry of the pre-manufactured trusses work properly. Let's talk really quickly about line roll using center lines. Center lines is very common in Asia where it works very well with their approach to building and their joinery approaches. Uh, but there's a lot of arguments for using it in North America with North American styles of timber framing as well. There are plenty of arguments out there for it being accurate than having a line, more accurate than having a line along one edge. But also it seems to work very well with templates. Templates aren't that common in North American approaches to timber framing, but, and I don't know why, because they can be very, very fast and they can reduce the number of opportunities for error. So it's a great approach. We'll get into a lot more about templates when we start making the templates and using them for the joinery layout. Um, and we'll get more into some of the nuances around center lines and why it works better in a lot of situations. But before we get into that, regardless of where you put your lines, there's one really important step that you have to take first. Okay, so here we have a simple eight by eight that's already complete for this job. And you can see we have chalk lines for a few different reasons. We'll get into more detail on it all later, but we, it made more sense to have our chalk lines a couple inches away from one edge. But regardless of where you put the chalk lines, once you're finished, it's a good idea to verify that everything is correct 
by using what a lot of people refer to as a squaring line. And it's just what you'd expect. You basically wrap a line all the way around the timber, always using your chalk line. So you put the long edge of the framing square against your chalk line and you draw a line across. Okay, we see it's already done here, of course. And then always using your chalk lines, you wrap them down either side. Where those two points meet, you should be able to roll this 180 degrees. Again, put the long edge of your framing square along your chalk line and those points should match up and everything should coordinate. If it doesn't, you need to check that all your blue lines were done or all your chalk lines were done properly. Now, critics of this approach will suggest that this is an additional step. Take some time, uh, take some extra time with your layout, uh, but that's not true. There are plenty of situations where your squaring line can serve double duty as another line that you need to, to make anyway. In this example, the squaring line is the bottom of the post. So this is the where we have to cut the bottom of the post off anyway. So we needed to wrap a line anyway. But there are a few other different situations where you can use your squaring line to serve double duty as another line in your project. And we'll get on to that in a minute. Okay, so we have our candidate timber in front of us on the bunks and our shop notes and we're ready to go. This timber is a little bit out of square. It has a little bit of a banana shape to it. Now, continuing the spirit of adding to the last video, I want to talk a little bit about how this banana shape may come back to haunt us and what we might do about it to, to fix the problem. Uh, I suspected that this timber from my initial timber survey that you should do at the beginning of all jobs, I, I realized that this timber may have a little bit of a banana shape to it. So what I did before snapping any chalk lines is I ran a string line. So let's take a look and see what that tells us. So this is the location of the tie beam and you can see that the string line shows almost a quarter of an inch of bow. Now we could run our chalk lines as normal without consideration to the bow and the building to go to, would go together just fine. Now remember we're using the, the um, housings to deal with the irregularities of the timber but also oftentimes housings have a structural role. Okay, so to explain the significance of that, let's take a look at one of the posts for the shop. Now we've got a number of different joints required on these members and uh, they all have very different structural roles in the frame. But what I've done is I've stripped out most of the joints and joinery and we'll focus primarily on the, uh, the tie beam and its associated brace. So we can house the braces to an, a nominal amount and it doesn't really matter if the timber is a little imperfect in this shoulder. Um, is a little bit less because in the case of most uh, braces, not all, but most braces, the absolute amount there isn't required. So we can just do whatever is required to allow us to deal with some of the imperfections of the timber. However, in the case of the tie beam, because this is taking load not only from the queen post, but also some second floor uh, loading as well, the engineers have asked for a one and a quarter inch shoulder depth. And this may be different in your situation, but for this one and a quarter inches, is required to successfully and properly transfer some of the load that this second floor, um, this tie beam is uh, taking down into, into the post. So what happens if our timber is slightly bowed away from the tie beam such that some of the assumptions that we've made about what the timber will give us in terms of a bearing shoulder there is invalid, or in other words, the shoulders risk being less than the engineered amounts. Well, there's a few different ways you can deal with this, but let's replace this perfect timber with a bowed one that I've artificially made here just to help illustrate the point. So what I've done here is I've put in a couple of guidelines there. that They call them guidelines in SketchUp, and they're just to illustrate a couple of different approaches to putting chalk lines, whichever, uh, whichever works for you. This would be half an inch away from... Uh, one edge or a nominal half inch and these are, of course are center lines but conceptually for this it doesn't really matter that much. So if you're thinking about this 10 by 8 timber as this 10 inch face being a, not a perfect 9 inch timbers in other words you've got a half inch of wiggle room on both sides to deal with whatever imperfection. One thing that you can do is basically pretend that that half inch is not even there and base everything all your calculations in your layout based on the surface of that hypothetical nine inch timber, in which case you don't really have to worry about it. The problem with that, and this may not appeal to some people, the problem with that is you end up with less 
uh, differing quantities of actual uh, shoulder depth there. You'll, you'll have the minimum that's required, but you may end up with a deeper shoulder in some situations, which cosmetically may uh, may bother some people. This bow, this timber that I have bowed artificially, is uh, has a three eighths of an inch bow, and it is uh, at the center. So you can see down here, for example, the uh, brace housing depth is a lot less than normal. So you're having a little bit of overhang here. If that's not your thing, uh, cosmetically, you may find that problematic, but that will work. And uh, in this situation, if you end up um, with a perfect timber and you've artificially uh, moved it inwards an extra half inch, you'll have a different shoulder depth there. Like, like I said, it'll be fine structurally because you have your minimum or greater, but cosmetically it'll look a little bit different. If that bothers you, you might want to consider some other options. Uh, one other way you can deal with this is actually fairly simple, if fairly similar, I should say. If you're interested in continuing to use your chalk lines and trying not to measure away from, from chalk lines too much, in other words, if you want to have a chalk line along one edge, what you can actually do is artificially just move your, your chalk lines a little bit such that you can still rely on them as is without having to measure the amount you're compensating, and you can um, reap all the efficiencies that go with that. Now the problem with that is you may end up finding that it also affects the position of some of, for example, your post top tenon. That may not be a problem in terms of getting tight journey, but it may result in some misalignment of the faces of these timbers if the one to which it's mating is not off by the same amount. So you have to either deal with that or be comfortable with some of the cosmetic or aesthetic repercussions of that. Now, the other option that I know some people do, for example, if you, ahead of time, if you know, or even after the fact, if you know that you're off by, in this case, three-eighths of an inch, what you can do is you can extend, just measure the amount that you need to compensate it for, and you can actually extend the length of your tie beam so that your shoulder is, in fact, what it needs to be at a minimum. Now, this is what a lot of people would call mapping, and that's perfectly fine. The problem is, is what you don't reap is the benefits of being able to make all your tie beams identical, and you have to keep track of measurements. And it's complicated because the other end of the tie beam, that post could be absolutely perfect, and there could be no compensation required. In that situation, you'll end up with a brace geometry that's slightly different. You'll end up with a timber that is asymmetrical and there just are a lot of risks for doing that wrong. It, it, it absolutely is possible. It can be done, but you have to be very organized. And uh, there's just a lot of, there could be some inefficiencies associated with that. There are three different scenarios and three different options for how to deal with that and how you choose to deal with some of those imperfections are basically uh, revolving around kind of your, um, your approach to work and your chosen uh, approach to, to doing all this. Okay, so it's time to line this timber. We're going to go through this fairly quickly because we've done it before, but we're going to put the level in the middle of the timber. This, this one is kind of irregular in a uniform way, so this will split the difference. We're going to put it on the tie beam face. Now, technically, I don't want to get into this in too much detail right now, but technically you don't even really need to level a face, but if you choose to do so, that face will typically have the housings associated with it relatively even in terms of their depth when visible on either, on either side. So if that's important, that may be one of the criteria you consider when deciding uh, which face to level at the beginning of the lining and layout process. In this situation, uh, the tie beam goes right across the whole face, so the, uh, the housings are going to be visible on both faces for the interior timbers. So what I'm going to do is level this face and um, carry on from there. So as always, we are going to denote on the timber where our level line is. And that ensures that we can go back to kind of our gold standard location if we ever have to. So let's level this up. Okay, that only took a couple minutes. Sometimes I will use actual cedar shims. It's a good idea that your uh, shim material is softer than the wood that you're actually using so that it doesn't dent up you know, where it's resting on it. Um, and uh, oftentimes though, all I need is a small you know, chip from some previous work and that'll do just fine. 
In this instance, just a small chip that came out of a mortise in, uh, in an earlier timber did the job just fine. So now it's time to uh, mark the ends and snap some lines. We'll take a minute while we're down here and make a quick little V notch so that our chalk line sits in there nicely. Now, now that you have all four marks on each end of the timber and you have one line snapped, technically you can start doing your layout right now. The problem is, if you get all the way to the other side of the timber and then you complete your squaring line and you find you've made a mistake, you have to undo all of your work. So if you're, if you're really confident and you've done you know, 100 uh, squaring lines in a row without any problem, you can actually start to do your layer right now, but I certainly don't recommend that for a beginner. And then for this project, for this, uh, for this video, we are gonna align all four sides first, come back to this and get going. Okay, so we're all, all the way back to our leveled face and we are ready to start positioning and drawing our joinery on the timber on all four sides. Uh, typically we would do our squaring along really quickly, but let's talk about um, story sticks versus tape measures quickly. Okay, let's talk quickly about story sticks. I mentioned story sticks in the last video and I got a few questions about them, so let's talk about them quickly. Story sticks are fairly commonly used in North America for cabinet making, but less so in timber framing, but I think you should consider them. So story sticks uh, basically mean uh, you can use the tape measure less and incur less of the risk of repetitive use of a tape measure. So basically it's a four-sided stick upon which you denote all the different locations of your joinery. Now you have four sides, so you can use one each face or one face or one edge Per, um, per face of the timber if you want, or if it's not too crowded, you can put everything all along, all along one edge. Now, you obviously you have to make your story stick perfectly, um, otherwise everything you lay out with it will be incorrect. But on balance, it's my opinion that you have a uh, less of a chance of, of an error using a story stick than you do with repeated use of a tape measure and all the kind of risks or opportunities for error that go along with it. So uh, I typically use a, a story stick for timber framing, also cabinetry, but for timber framing, if the, uh, if the timbers are less than about 12 feet, I find it hard to get material that's nice and straight um, for, for pieces that are longer than that. Um, but anything less than, than 12 feet, I will typically use a story stick. It's my opinion that they're uh, less error prone, as I said, but they're also a bit faster. However, this member is 18 feet long, so we are going to resort to the old-fashioned tape measure. Okay, let's talk about tape measures really quickly. One of the courses I took with Steve Chapel down in Maine, at the beginning of the course, what we did is all the participants ran their tape measures out along this big, long workbench, and unsurprisingly, uh, they didn't all agree. One of the main sources of error was the hook on the end. Some of them weren't made properly right from the beginning, and the hook didn't move as it should. And some of the carpenters who were participating in the course brought some old, very heavily used tape measures and the holes that these rivets go through had started to ovalize, so they were lying a little bit. Um, and less often, uh, but still did happen, is some of the actual graduations themselves were wrong. In other words, an inch wasn't an inch and a foot wasn't a foot. What I recommend you do is get yourself a few good quality tape measures and run them all out and whichever ones agree pick one of those. I also suggest you use the same tape measure. That way if they're slightly uh, off of an absolute measurement, at least they're all the same and that will usually keep you out of trouble, though not always. Um, it's hard to know exactly what's correct without having a machinist or, or a fancy reference 
material. So get a whole bunch of them, run them out, find which ones agree, pick your favorite, and use that for the whole project. What a lot of folks will do, just to make sure that there is uh, there aren't any problems with the hook, because even if your hook is perfect, um, sometimes what you're hooking onto at the end of the timber will not be perfect. A lot of folks will do what they call burning an inch. So you have your line here, which is say the end of your timber or the bottom of your timber or the end of your post-op tenon, for example. And you have that line right there and you'll, instead of, instead of laying the hook on that line or hooking it over, what you'll do is you'll put the one inch mark on that line. And that just means that this won't be a source of error in your measurement. Uh, I don't do that. Uh, I, I just find it's a bit error prone. It's easy to be one off and not notice. So what I often do is I'll burn 10 inches or I'll burn a foot. That way if you're laying something out and you forget to compensate for that in your measurements and you're 10, 10 inches or a foot off, it's a little bit more obvious. So as I said, this timber is too long for a story stick with the material that I have on hand. So we are going to use a tape measure. In this situation, uh, I will hook on to the end and we'll change the camera angle up and I'll explain to you why. Okay, so we are looking at the very top of this same timber where there will be a post top tenon. What I've done is I've used the, used the chalk lines and squared it off and I've actually cut it right at the end of where the tenon will be. Now, it's my opinion that your mortise and tenon fit should be accurate along the width and the thickness of the tenon, give you a nice sliding fit. Uh, but for many, not all, but for many tenons, it's less important that the, the length be laser beam precise. In fact, with a lot of green timbers, it's common practice to deliberately leave room on the end of the tenon so that your tenon doesn't bottom out in the bottom of the mortise as it dries. Now, it is undeniably very convenient to be able to use the hook on the end for the timber, but for all the reasons I described, uh, before you should avoid it unless you're in a situation like this because what really what happens is any error associated with say the hook or, or any other problem is all hidden within the tenon and since you've got a lot of buffer room in there it doesn't really matter we talked before about using the one inch mark or the 10 or 12 inch mark for the start point for measuring out along the timber to place all your joinery really what you're doing in this instance is you're you're starting at the shoulder of your joint and you're measuring everything from that point. So instead of burning an inch or burning 10 inches or 12 inches, effectively what you're doing is you're burning four inches. Any error that is gonna happen due to the hook on the end has already happened in here in your mortise or in your tenon where it doesn't matter and everything else from there on down is just fine. Now there are plenty of situations out there where this wouldn't work and you shouldn't accept um, the risk associated with using the hook on the end of the timber places where the absolute number absolute length is very critical and important uh, like rafters for example top plates that butt up against each other and any other situations where the absolute length has to be perfect you're better off burning your inch or burning your 10 inches or your foot as I do okay so we have our trusty notes with us as well as a 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil for making really good accurate lines. Let's run the tape measure out and see how we make out. Okay, so using my notes, all I'm doing here, and this is the master face, this is the face that we leveled off. All I'm doing here is I'm making a quick tick mark at the bottom of the joining relocations for the various members that are intersecting on this face. So what I, so for example, we have the tie beam is around here somewhere. All I'll do is I'll make a quick tick mark and then at the brace distance away from there and these happen to be 36 inches away I'll make another mark here. Now I have the actual measurement from the end of the tape recorded here so I don't have to calculate 36 inches or add 36 inches to the bottom of the housing. Uh, and everything else I will measure up from there with the framing square. Now you have a decision at this point to make about how you want to get the measurements to the other sides of the timbers. There's a couple different schools of thought and I'm not going to be prescriptive about it. I'm going to describe how I approach it. The way some people do it is they will make a tick mark on this master face for every single piece of joinery on the timber on all sides. And then what they will do is they'll use the framing square to transfer these lines or these points all the way around the timber and you know when they roll it they'll actually draw the joinery on there 
but the, the locations they will find from transferring around this space. What that requires is that every single situation where you do that, the process of transferring has to be relatively perfect. So there are opportunities for error every time you do the transferring. Now, the other option is, say in this situation, is you've squared off your end very accurately, or at least you hope it's very, very accurate. What you could do is the way some people do it is they'll roll the timber and they'll rehook the tape or reestablish their story stick on the opposite face and then mark out the joinery relocations there. Now, that requires that your end is perfect. If it's not, then every single one of them will be off by a little bit. But here's the thing. They both should agree. If they don't agree, there's something wrong. So this is the way I do it. I will mark out all of the joinery that has to go on here, uh, on the timber anywhere, on this face. And then what I'll do is I'll transfer the critical measurements. For example, um, I will transfer the location of, in this instance, we have a, the main tie beam here, but we also have a girt coming out up here. I will transfer the location of the girt over with the framing square or with the assistance of templates if, that, if that's applicable. Then when I roll it over, it should be the same as what my tape measure says when I run it out. If it's not, I check something. If it's the same, and it should be, if it's the same, then I'll leave it and carry on. What I don't do is transfer over the brace locations. Because what's really important for brace fitment is that they are the correct distance away from the, um, the member that they are bracing. In other words, Pythagoras insists that they are a set distance away. So what I'll do, in this situation for example, we have a girt coming out over here. I will transfer the location of the girt, but I will not transfer the location from here uh, of its brace. What I'll do is I'll roll it over, I will double check that it's correct, and then I will measure down, uh, these ones are actually 48 inch, these are very long braces, I will actually transfer over, or I will measure down from that location that I've confirmed is correct, 48 inches, and I'll, that's how I will position and locate the brace mortise from there. So in all situations, all I'm doing is, is little tick marks, and uh, either transferring or measuring from the top, or both as, uh, as needed. So I want to thank everybody very much for their patience as they waited for the second video to come out. The next video, we're going to take you into the woodworking shop. We're going to make some templates and we're going to actually apply those to the timber. We're going to talk a little bit more about how you keep all the joinery square on the surface of an imperfect timber, especially when a lot of the tools that we're using, like the skill saw in the chain mortiser, they have to sit on the surface of this imperfect timber. So the question that I get is how do you make sure, say, the inside wall of your mortise is orthogonally accurate to everything else. We're going to get into all of those details. The good news is there's a bit of a project update. We have a big window opening up and this uh, this fall, winter, spring and summer are going to be all about getting the next building up on our property which is the woodworking shop which is the subject of this video series. So there's lots of great stuff coming up. Thank you for your patience. Stick with us. We'll see you next time.